And everybody find who they're going to do business with next week? Yes? All right, good. Before we begin, I want to I wanna thank our sponsors. Most importantly, our lunch sponsor for today is Delaware Business Times. Um, Delaware Business Times jumped on board with the Delaware Economic Summit back in 2014 for our very first year. Delaware Business Times was new to the community, as were we, and I just want to say thank you to them. Avi, if you would, stand up for me. Charlie, Alan, Lisa, thank you. If you get a chance, thumb through your program booklet. Um, most of the companies that are involved here, as well as the organizers, are all private companies. They all have real jobs outside of running this summit. But the common theme is that we all care about the community. We care about Delaware. So if you would, just take a chance and, and pay some recognition to those sponsors. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Tony Wido. Um, we thought about getting Tony back in 2014, but he was busy doing this show called Undercover Boss, which I'm sure he's going to talk a little bit about today. Um, Tony's a Fortune 50 executive and entrepreneur, turnaround CEO. Fortune 50, not Fortune 500, Fortune 50. There's not many companies in that 50. It's only 50. So he's raised over $500 million in public and private debt and equity. $500 million. There are investment firms out there that don't even manage $500 million. He's created thousands of jobs. Highly sought after speakers, done over 120, 125 of these things. Some to over 1,000 people. Some to a more intimate crowd like we have here today of about 100, which you're going to get to see the interactive part that we get to enjoy that they don't. And also holds a BS degree from Penn State University, an MBA from Cornell, and an international MBA from Queen's University in Canada. It's my pleasure, Tony Wido. Thanks, man. My pleasure. And I'm 163 years old. Um, if you add all that experience up, right? Yeah. Um, you know, look, um, I, I am blessed to be here with you today. And that's how I think about it. Because, you know, honestly, um, I've done this over 100 times, but it's certainly um, always, I'm always intimate and passionate with my smaller groups. And so you guys are considered a smaller group. So congratulations, you're going to get to participate today. <laughs> Trepidation, yeah, scary, right? This, the assignment's going to be pretty, pretty, pretty meek and mild, so you guys won't have, won't have too much, uh, uh, don't have much trepidation, okay? But no, I think, you know, honestly, I do this because I am personally very passionate about leadership. And the difference between leadership and management. I have two MBA degrees. First of all, why the heck, Tony, did you ever get two MBA degrees? That doesn't make any sense, right? One's an international degree, one's a domestic degree. But the point is, in those two MBAs, I never got anything on leadership, really what leadership is. So we're missing that in our curriculum today. Many of you out here probably have graduate uh, business degrees. You've missed that in your curriculum. I'm very passionate about leadership. I fundamentally believe that it's the single biggest deficit in the United States of America today. Yeah, I'm worried about 19 plus trillion dollars for sure. We all should be. But I think leadership is the fundamental issue that we're missing in America today. Um, I've been blessed, I said that before and I mean that. I've had tremendous opportunities to do awesome things, work with awesome people, but um, you know, while now my job is to help and give back and help those of you who want to be a leader. By the way, leadership is voluntary. You have to volunteer. If you want to be a leader, I want to give you a perspective on that that you didn't get in graduate school, you didn't get in undergraduate school, you probably didn't get in the companies that you work for. Uh, but what I believe to be super important. So I'm gonna take my 163 years of experience and try to get that into an hour and 15 minutes and hopefully uh, give you something to walk away with. Here's the thing, this is my stuff, my words. I want them to become your words. 
take my words and make them your own. Walk out of here today and you've done my heart good. I will feel good that I've done a good job for you guys today. And it's about me working for you today. My job is to work for you today, to give you my, my years of experience captured in these 12 commandments. So on your table, there's, there's, some, there's some handouts, or there's a handout, just pass those around for now. We're gonna get, we're gonna get back to those in a minute. Wow, is that scary? Holy smokes. That's not, that's not Alex from yesterday. That's not a picture of Alex from yesterday. That, that is me on Undercover Boss. I did two shows on Undercover Boss. Yes, that is a scary, uh, that is a very scary uh, um, get up that I've got going on there. Um, you know, um, it, it is really, uh, again, it's a really, it's, it was a blessing for me to be chosen to do that show. I did, I actually did two Undercover Boss shows. Um, that, that's my show, and then, then there's a show called Busted Bosses, if you, if you, they are on Netflix, which is really scary, that's actually really scary. Um, but look, it, it, was a, it was a real honor for me to be able to interface with my employees and find out what the heck was really going on in my company. Right, we're going to talk about, we're going to answer, we'll do some Q&A at the end, and we can certainly talk more about um, Undercover Boss, but first of all, the wig was glued to my head. <laughs> for 14 days. Now process that for a second. Just think about that, right? I couldn't take it off and put it on my nightstand at night, right? It was glued to my head for 14 days. Holy smokes. Gets awful nasty after a period of time, right? Yeah. <laughs> and it stuck right to my hair with glue, real glue, right? It's like, what the heck is that all about? So the other fear was when you took off the wig, your real hair is going to come off, right? So you're going to be bald when you're done with the show. Um, the second thing that people always ask is, how the heck do they pull that off? You're in a, you're in a, you're in a business and they're running around with cameras shooting you. How do they not know what's undercover boss, right? Who has that question? Raise your hand if you have that question. It's, it's crazy. Well, here's what they do, and we'll talk more about it at the end, at the end in Q&A. But what they do is they pose and they make you pose as if you're doing another show. The crew consists of about 40 people on the camera, on the filming crew. And they make you wear uh, basically name badges and, and, and all kinds of other paraphernalia t-shirts, and the crew, crew, crew wears t-shirts calling the show something else. So they call the show, in my case, they called it The Startup. So we actually filmed two shows while we were filming Undercover Boss. Crazy, right? Crazy the length that they go to to disguise it. But I, I will, I'm here to tell you that it isn't produced like you may think. They don't say, here, Tony, here's your script. Please read from this script, right? It happens real time, live action, it's happening. And what do they hope I do? What's the camera crew hope I do? Something really ridiculously stupid, right? And I tried to avoid that, but you guys make your judgments for yourself when you watch the show, whether I avoided that or not. Um, anyway, it was a great experience, and I, I felt blessed to be able to do that and help my employees. Um, you know, uh, I took about 20 pages of notes during the show, and that's what I went back and worked on the year and a half after that. Okay, so I gotta frame it for you guys, right? I gotta frame this conversation. And so this is a bit of a report card for the United States of America. Right? It's a bit of a report card. Unemployment, so there's, you know, when you think about unemployment, you have U1 through U6. By the way, if any of you really are bored at night, pick up your economics book, and read about the unemployment as described as U1, as opposed to the unemployment as described as U6. And by the way, the number we hear on, on TV and every, every week is, is U3, all right? We are at a very diabolical moment in the history of America from an employment base. We have the same number of people working roughly that worked in the late 70s. Everybody processing that for a second? Hear what I just said? The same number of people working in America as we had in the late 70s. Holy smokes. 
Now, back in the late 70s, there was about 180 million people in America. Today, there's over 320 million, 315 million in America. There is government dispersing money to, in various forms, to over 100 million people. Oh my word, the teeter-totter is just about ready to flip, right? Very important point of the, the report card. GDP growth has been either flat or declining. The current trade deficit, we know the tra what trade does when you're constantly running the deficit, we know what that does to affect our economy and our currency. And then the federal uh, uh, budget, we, we've, all heard, we've all, all heard about that. Um, let me ask you a question to this group. Why do you think that people just gloss over the fact that we're 19 plus trillion dollars in debt? I mean, anybody have an idea on that? Doesn't seem to be affecting them, right? Right, right? So when the politicians, um, and excuse me, by the way, I've got allergies, terrible allergies, so I'm trying to keep myself hydrated, but <clears throat> the politicians keep saying, oh my word, we're $19 trillion in debt. And yet you get in your car every morning, go to work, and nothing happens. Here's the really diabolical thing. I'm here to tell you, and it's not my calculations, it's not my mathematics. I'm here to tell you when you get to about 24 or 25 trillion, there is a point of no return. We are two years or so away from that number at the rate we're going. The point of no return means that something large has to happen to reconfigure, to reconfigure the, debt can, the debt of America. So what are those large things that can happen? Certainly currency devaluation could happen. Many things could happen. But I'm here to tell you that as leaders, ladies and gentlemen, you're all leaders in this great state of ours, as leaders, you need to understand that we are very close to the, to the tipping point, right? We got 100 million people receiving money from the government and a workforce the size of 1978 supporting those people. So we've got issues in America. And the, the, the thing that hurts my heart the most is that the middle class folks are getting beaten up. That's what hurts my heart the most, because though the government tells you, don't worry about it, we'll give you this and we're gonna give you that and we're gonna take care of you this and redistribute more wealth and do this and do that, what really is missing for the middle class is opportunity. It's jobs that we need to create in America. That will fix the middle class. If you look at the 1960s, John Kennedy did a couple things. He lowered corporate taxes, did, a, did some lowering of personal taxes, but lowered corporate taxes and got rid of tons of regulations. And we enjoyed an enormous explosion of growth. Great job, President Kennedy. President Reagan did it precisely the same exact thing in 1980. All, I mean precisely, exactly the same. You have a Republican and a Democrat doing exactly the same thing and curing this problem. So ladies and gentlemen, this isn't about Republicans or Democrats or any of that. This is about leadership, doing the right thing. This is what this is about today. My hour, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna really get you to think about leadership. Because it doesn't matter what, what political party you're from. It doesn't matter. It matters whether you put the needs of others ahead of your own needs. It matters whether you have a passion to serve or you don't. Nothing to do with an affiliation of some party. Nothing to do with it. So I feel my heart, and I hope you all share with that, share with, with that feeling with me, is that we gotta take care, we've gotta give these, the folks in the middle class a chance to, to, to survive and thrive. And the way to do that is, is, is growth and unleashing the, the, the America. It's not Americans that are broken. That report card stinks, but it's not because of Americans, it's because of the leaders in America that are broken. America is the most awesome country in the world. Absolutely, without a question, there is no debate on that subject. Free enterprise means freedom. America is an awesome, awesome country. It is unabashedly the best in the world, without question. American leadership needs retooled.
Our report card. It's not the whole report card, it's just a part of it. Twenty thousand direct manufacturing jobs over the last twenty years. I, I gotta tell you what, my heart's sick about this one. In in a couple of years, we could have no jobs related to DuPont in this state. My heart's sick about that. Think how many people went to college and kids and families that were raised and you know, kept the you know, kept everybody in business in the state for so many years. My heart's sick about that. Real wages have dropped 10% from 09 to 2014 from $708 to $639 a week. Real wages, this is this middle class that I'm talking about. They're getting beat up beyond belief by the exact, here's what's really crazy, by the exact policies that politicians say are designed to help them. There's a lot of things I want you to take home with you today after we talk, and that's one of them, okay? The people are a lot smarter than politicians, okay? The same policies of redistribution of wealth are killing the middle class of America and Delaware. Household income has declined in five out of the last seven years. One out of six Delawareans are on food stamps. One out of five Delaware children live in poverty. Our schools are the sixth most expensive to operate, and yet our results are in the bottom. You can make an argument 42nd, 44th, 39th. Whatever one would like to make that argument is fine. But the point is, we're paying more and getting less, and unfortunately, we have an enormous crime problem in this awesome, awesome city of Wilmington. Are Delawareans broke? Is it, is, it, is it the people that are broken? It's not the people that are broken. We're awesome in Delaware. Let's all raise our hands if you think you're awesome in Delaware. I'm, we're awesome, maybe, right? We're an awesome state. We're a great state. We're great people. What's broken is the leaders of the state. I'm just going to tell you flat out. I don't care whether you're an R or a D. It doesn't matter to me. I'm agnostic completely. They haven't led. They have not led. That's a problem. That's the report card that you get when you don't lead. What are some of the great things? I'm not going to end that, the discussion on Delaware with that. Let's talk about some of the great things in Delaware. And this is the start of, of a participation. This table, one thing that's great about Delaware. The Queens, this is an awesome place, right? Great place to hold business meetings, right? One thing that's great about Delaware. Food. Beaches. Great beaches, right? People move from New Jersey to come to live at the beach in Delaware, right? No sales tax. Awesome stuff. What else is great about Delaware? Wow, who said that? Awesomely strategic. We're one hour and 20 minutes from the capital of the United States of America and one hour and 20 minutes from the financial capital of the world. You're absolutely right. It's an enormously powerful location for our little 900,000 uh, population state. What else? Great about Delaware. Give me that, Josh. What's that mean? It could be one degree to your point, right? Exactly. We know each other. We're family, right? We're small. We're the size of one congressional district. Our whole state. We should be family, right? That's important. It's important. We got to count on each other. Anything else? Delaware River. Awesome, right? We have agriculture. We've got manufacturing. We've got, you know, great workforce. Think about the workforce, unfortunately, many of which are unemployed or underemployed right now. Right? We know 15% or more in America are either unemployed or underemployed. Not participating in the workforce. But we have a great workforce. Holy smokes, right? Companies could come to Delaware and set up shop, 
and hire 200 people tomorrow. And that would make everybody's business thrive. Delaware is a great state. I'm biased. I've got a, my family lives here. Lots of my, my relatives live here. Uh, my son goes to the University of Delaware. Uh, I'm Delaware proud. Hope you all are too. But I'm really sad about our report card. I'm proud, but sad, and that's what I'd like to leave you with. How do we fix that? How do we fix that? By the way, anybody else have allergies going on? <laughs> Holy smokes, man. I'm waking up every morning going, I, what, what, like, uh, like, am I ready to die today, or what's going on, man? Okay, so uh, let's start at the very top. Can you be thoughtful and, and kind and still be honest with people? Then why do, yeah, everybody's saying, yeah, yeah, Tony, we can, yeah, Tony, we can do that, right? But then why the heck are we all so politically correct and afraid to tell the truth? Why? Because we learned it on television, right? Why? The best thing as a leader that you can do is tell people the truth. You don't have to be rude about it. We somebody should phone up Donald Trump and tell him that. You don't have to be rude about it. But the best positive thing you can do as leaders, again, you've, leadership is a, voluntary, is a voluntary practice. You're volunteering now to do something. Your responsibility is to look after the betterment and the, we the well-being of your people first and the organization in which you lead. And you come way down the, li the list. You come last as the leader. So, so if you're not giving people honest, clear feedback, are you doing the job of a leader? No, you're failing them. You're failing them. So when I was nine or 10 years old, I was standing on the, the sidelines of a football field and I was in Pee Wee football and uh, Pop Warner football and it was me, my dad, and my coach. And my dad was ta talking to my coach and my, dad, my coach said, uh, or my dad said, well, why is my son, why is my son playing, you know? Do you ever hear that? When you have, any of you have kids, right, that play sports? Why isn't my son playing? Oh, Mr. Weedo, your son absolutely has absolutely no athletic skills whatsoever. Now, was that thoughtful and kind? You think I heard it, first of all? Yeah, I think I heard it, right? Was that thoughtful and kind? No, it wasn't thoughtful and kind. But what did it do for me? It made me into a maniac. Right? I said, no one, and I mean no one, is ever going to say that about me again. So I went on to play football and start at, in 9th and 10th grade at, in, at varsity in high school and play in college because of that one guy's comment. If you don't, if you're not honest with someone and you don't give them the truth, you, you are stealing their future away from them. You are preventing them from being all that they can be. Yes, you're protecting yourself. We're going to come back to that theme a lot today. You're protecting yourself. Right? You're not going to get in trouble with HR. Right? Your career. Right? I, I'm a turnaround CEO. So I go, into, I go into companies and as a turnaround guy, the first thing I do is try to mask the troops and see what I've got. And you would be surprised at the techniques people have devised to hide in a company. People have gotten super creative about how to hide and not be accountable for anything or responsible for anything or ever have done anything. You guys are all here because you're leaders. You've chosen not that, you've not chosen that route. You've chosen the route of leading others to victory, putting yourself last. Very important. Equal opportunity versus equal outcome. What's that mean? Anybody, anybody, come on now. Tell me about that, what, what do you mean? You cannot guarantee, this gentleman saying you cannot guarantee equal outcomes. 
you can only guarantee equal opportunity. Then why the heck are we trying to do that in America today? Everybody doesn't get, you know, a, a flat screen television. Everybody doesn't get a cell phone. It's equal opportunity to strive to get those things. This is the fundamental foundational ingredient of the free enterprise system. As I said earlier, I'm going to connect the dots. The free enterprise system is the way the middle class thrives. We've got to be very, very mindful. What I tell my people when I stand up in front of my, my, my new company that I'm going to turn around is that I will personally fight to the death for each of you to provide each of you the exact same opportunity. I will fight to the death for you. But there is no equal outcome in this company. Starting today, there is no equal out outcome in this company. What happens to that audience of folks? They, that's why I call it self-selection. Many people say, oh my word, well, if that's not going to be the case, he's just discovered my hiding place where I was hiding. I need to go find another job. So as a turnaround guy, I don't really ever, I, rare, I rarely terminate mass groups of people. They terminate themselves because they don't fit that, that thesis and that philosophy. Paying it forward. You are the leaders. You need to put yourself behind everyone else and you need to understand what you need to do for your organization's success. And think about the generations that will come after you. Narcissism is a horrifically bad disease in America today. What does that mean? Only thinking about yourself 24 hours a day, seven days a week, what's in it for me, nonstop. I mean, holy smokes, right? My kids, my son, you know, always on Facebook, always doing, it's always about them. I worry. Anybody else worry with me? I worry that we're training a generation of very narcissistic people. As leaders, please do not fall into that trap. Putting the needs of many and the organization you're running, we talked about that, passion to serve, and that's really important. If you don't like serving other people. Please do not become a leader or try to lead other people. If you're leading because you want to be important and you want to show off and you want to put your feet on the desk and you want to yell and tell people what, yell at other people and tell them what to do. And if you don't want to model the behavior you're asking them to, to, to execute, Please do not be a leader. Honest to God, America's suffering terribly from that. Please do not choose leadership if you can't choose to serve other people. And by the way, you can't fake it, right? We're going to talk about that in a little bit, right? Can you fake it? Can you fake sincerity, really, honestly? And the, the, all these knucklehead politicians, think about it, right? They try to pretend that they, we're all dumb. And we know they're full of it. Most of the stuff they say isn't true. It's astounding. But we all accept it because that's politics. Holy smokes, man. We're in a bad way. We're in a bad way. I had dinner uh, about a year or a year and a half ago with Governor Christie. And, you know, uh, it, was one, it was a really an amazing dinner. But... What was really amazing about it is I said, you know, at the end of the dinner, I mean, I was like, wow, this is great. Governor, this is awesome. Thank you so much for all the wonderful stories. And he has some serious stories. Let me just tell you. Some serious stories about New Jersey. Holy smokes. And by the way, UD guy, right? Holy, yeah, UD, right? Awesome. Um, I said, what is the thing, man? What is the thing? Like, how have you been able to do this in the state? You like took on all these people and people giving you death threats. And I mean, how, how have you been able to do, do this? He goes, Tony, I just tell people no. I said, it can't be that easy, right? He goes, it, it is that easy. Tell them the truth and tell them no when it's no. Here's the problem. Our leaders are telling us yes when it actually should be no. It starts with the family, doesn't it? If the answer is no... Say the answer's no. Why don't politicians say the answer's no? 
Who said that? They might not get reelected. So what the heck are they in this thing for? Are they in it because they want to take care of all of us? Are they in it because they want, they want to put themselves behind all of us and lead us to victory and do the right thing? Well, that tells us that they don't want to do that, right? We need more leaders who want to put the people they lead ahead of themselves. And by the way, politicians should have term limits. So they actually have to go out and get a real job. These people that have been in politics for 20, 30, 40 years, it's not normal. That's not the way the whole process was supposed to be designed. You're supposed to go serve your fellow citizen and then go back and get a real job. It's the only way you can, it's the only way you can know what's going on, right? I mean, holy smokes, it's common sense. Say no. When it's no, say no. Everybody agree with that as leaders? Are you willing to say no to people? Saying yes when it's really no means what? You're really caring about who instead of the people you're leading. You're caring about yourself, right? If you're focused on yourself, you're going to say yes to everybody. Oh, you want that? Oh, absolutely. I'm going to give you that. I'm going to give you that. I'm going to give you that. Oh, you want something else? Great. And then you leave, and then the other person leaves the conversation. They go, that guy's a great guy. Wow, he's a great guy. He's giving me all this stuff. Come on, guys and ladies. We're not that stupid, are we? Seriously. It's time to get real. It's time to get real with leadership. It's time to do the right thing. Look, today's about me giving you something, hopefully, that you can take with you. I want you to have something you can take with you. But it's not about me. I want to be clear. Today's not about me. It's about each of you. And I want you to make my words your words. I want you to take something home with you. Okay? And I want you to practice it. And it starts, by the way, practicing with your family. My journey really started as a kid. I grew up, small town, central Pennsylvania. No money whatsoever. My dad always had two or three jobs to make ends meet. And I had the opportunity, though, to sit and listen to my dad. And I was the youngest, the baby of the family, by 10 years. I had a chance to sit and listen to my older brother, my older sister, my father, and my mother. And I actually, by accident, thank God, I actually, you know, listened to what they were saying. I don't know how I did it, because I used to fight them tooth and nail on all kinds of stuff, right? But I actually took in some stuff. I actually got the chance to do some trial and error because I was so much younger than everybody in my family that I got a chance to sort of play the big boy. When I was 10, I got to play, you know, at nine or 10, I got to play like I was 19 or 20 because I got to hang out with my brother, right? So listening and learning through your life, you all have done it. My point here is this, every one of you have a whole giant bucket of learning that you're probably not utilizing. I'm gonna challenge each of you on that. You had great, all of you have had blessed lives, really blessed lives because you're here really blessed lives. Reflect on that. Take away all that learning. By the way, you'll find out as we talk through this leadership, uh, my principles today, that it is a lot of common sense. But people don't practice it. People don't practice it. There's that, there's that horribly redundant thing called commitment to serve up there again. I'm writing a book on, uh, on leadership and, you know, the words servant leadership keep coming out in the book on a variety of different levels. Um, but I'm really serious about this, ladies and gentlemen, seriously. If you aren't, if your DNA is not constructed such that you are really jazzed about serving, please don't do a leadership job. You are doing your people a tremendous disservice. And by the way, your companies as well. By the way, it's okay to be an individual contributor. There's nothing wrong with being an a great individual contributor. If you don't want to serve, I will submit you cannot lead. Honoring the past and learning from history, holy smokes, man, are we repeating history over and over again? In 1947, 
Attlee beat Churchill for, to become Prime Minister of England. Attlee decided that he was going to put in place all kinds of things because the English people had just been through horrific World War II, right? Horrific, you know, food shortages and bombings and just horrific World War II. So the government was going to come in because the government's much smarter and they were going to provide health care, they were going to provide housing, they were going to take over all the major industries, and fundamentally they were going to create a uh, socialist economy. 47 to 1980. The data is incredibly clear. From 1947 to 1980 in America, we lapped Great Britain like six times around the track. Our free enterprise system was so powerful that it blew the, everybody away in the world. It wasn't because Americans are better people than the English. However, I'm a little bit biased. We are great people, Americans. It was because the system doesn't work. <laughs> it's so obvious a blind person can see it. The system of socialism doesn't work. It doesn't protect the middle class. It doesn't do what the advertisers say that it does do. <laughs> it's astounding. It's astoundingly simple to understand that. From 1980, Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan created a partnership, and the UK changed into a much more free market system and eliminated many of the public services and privatized industry and did all kinds of things that were about the free enterprise system. So you saw this horrible flat curve in England, and you saw this wonderful curve in America from 1947 to 1980, and then suddenly in 1980, you saw the curve start going like this at the UK. The economic curve. This is all about economy, right? Economics. It is astoundingly clear, ladies and gentlemen. It does, it's not up for debate. You will lose the debate. There's only one way for everyone to prosper. Everyone. This class and this class to prosper is the free enterprise system, without question, beyond a shadow of a doubt. Learn from history. Don't give up. Have a belief. Have a belief and don't give up. And then sort out what's real as opposed to what you hear on television. What does that mean? Anybody ever think shot at that? What's that mean? Sort out what's real as opposed to what's on TV. Thoughts on that? While well, you're paying attention now, and they'll you just ate lunch, but you have to pay attention. What's real? It's not always a happy ending. Wow, that's awesome. That's awesome. I've given this talk about 120 times, various versions of this talk. That was the smartest answer I've ever heard when I asked that question. He wins the $10,000 that I had for, for somebody with the, smartest, <laughs> with the smartest answer to the question. You guys didn't participate. Okay, all right. Don't take a bunch of Claritin in the morning, just, just F FYI, and then try to do a talk like this. <clears throat> Wow. Um, some of those foundational truths that I have learned. What you're going to hear about the 12 commandments in a minute are, is based on my foundational truths. I'll share them with you. I'll invite you to make them yours. Or I'll invite you to have your own. But here's this, what, what's really super important about this point. As leaders, you got to believe in something. Have foundational truths. They don't have to be mine. Obviously, I'm telling you what mine are because you've invited me to talk about leadership today. Shame on you. Never do that again, right? But have beliefs. You cannot run any entity with poles. What do the people think today? Therefore, I'm going to change my belief. Holy smokes, what a train wreck. What a train wreck. 
You cannot run your organizations. You cannot run your family. You cannot run this country. You cannot run the state of Delaware by polls. What do the populists think? You've got to say, like Governor Christie says, you've got to say no. There's not always a happy ending. But if you're always thinking about the greater good of the many, then things will come out all right in the end. If you're thinking about the greater good of you, we're in trouble. That's the message you need to take from this. The free enterprise system works. We talked about it. There's no question. It's not even up for debate. There's no question about it. Equal opportunity doesn't mean equal outcome. We talked about that. Everyone is titled to their own opinion, just not their own set of facts. Super important. I'm a very, you know, unfortunately, I've been beaten into my head. I'm a very database person. Right? Data drives lots of my decisions, most of them. Um, and the data is overwhelmingly clear. Work represents weightlifting for the character. If, you, if my book comes out, you read my book, you're going to hear that a lot in there, about work representing weightlifting for the character. My dad always had two or three jobs. He had character of a Goliath, even though he was only five foot nine inches tall. Because he always put other people's needs ahead of his own, his family's needs ahead of their, uh, his own. The, the, the companies that he worked in, the businesses that he tried to start. So it is, if you don't idle, you know, if you don't work and you don't, aren't productive, and I don't care what it is, be productive at something. By the way, I try to tell my sons that all the time. Be productive at something, but not video games, right? Uh, work represents a powerful element to keep this glue of United, all 320 million of us together. If we don't honor work, we're in trouble. Right? We're in trouble. Number 10, uh, hands up and second chances should be part of our culture. This is something that I believe in really, really intimately because I have been blessed to be able to give people second chances as a leader and be able to give people hand, hands up when they've, they've fallen. If you watch my show, I get the chance to help some really awesome families who are, uh, frankly, in, in trouble. You know, uh, the, the one of it will bring, you know, we'll put it this way, it brought tears to my eyes in the show. When you watch the show, hopefully it will for you too because it is about your heart. And, you know, this family, two beautiful little girls, they were, they were one week from being thrown, this is true, they were one week from being thrown out of their house and their car being repossessed. And they were identified by accident, by happenstance in my company of 20,000 people they happen just to be identified. I mean, they talk about how all the universe works sort of in, you know, in harmony, right? They were able to be identified by the CBS and the show, and I was able to help them and buy them a house and buy them a car. But they weren't lazy. They weren't sitting on the sofa going, please, give me a handout. Both were working, and the husband had a second job. They're in Louisiana. They weren't getting paid very much for their work. So it's a struggle, but we should all, as leaders, all celebrate second chances for people and hands, and hands up for people. Here's where it gets really murky and ugly. When a hand up turns into a hand out. A hand up over generations is a hand out. Make no mistake about it. You're, then you're no longer celebrating work you're no longer building someone's character. You're no, because by the way, we're all 300 million of us are together in this thing, right? We're all together. And we're only as strong as our weakest links. As a leader, you have to make a decision as when hand ups become handouts. Handouts help no one. No one. They look like they do. They look like they're helping. They're deteriorating the individual the individual and the family, the community, the town, the city, the state, all the way up the line to, to, to our great country. It, it's a deterioration. And that's what we've got to keep in mind as leaders. You might have to say no. All outcomes aren't always great, right? Yeah. So that's my foundational truth. I would encourage you to have your own. 
Uh, let, me act, let me back up. I'm, I'm, I'm a real subtle guy. You know, you could kind of get to know me now. I'm real subtle. I'm not encouraging you. I'm requiring you to have your own truths. Part of, you invited me. I have to tell you what the deal is, right? You have to have your own foundational truths. It's important. By the way, will people follow people that change their mind every 15 minutes based on the polls? It's ridiculous, right? It's bizarre. Nobody respects you. They tell you they might respect you and they can get away with stuff. They're all real happy, but they're not really respecting you. Most importantly, you're not respecting the entity in which you're leading. Okay, 12 commandments. You have, all have a piece of paper on your table. Um, I'm going to assign a commandment per table. Ladies, passion. That's your commandment. Okay, you're going to go first. I'm going to give you this. You got to decide amongst yourselves who's going to talk. Um, you guys can get together since you're small. Uh, caring. You're going to go right down the line. You guys want to get together with them. Earned. Persistence, results, team, you guys, judgment, you guys, accountability, humility over there in the corner, courage, did I get you guys yet? Courage, honesty, and gratitude. If I had... If I had 15 commandments, you guys would be included too. Sorry about that, but feel free. You'll, you'll get to critique everybody else, everybody else's view. Here's the thing, right? Again, I told you, I'm here for a reason, and the reason is to let you walk away with something. And the only way you're going to walk away with anything, including your own points of view on this stuff, is engage with some dialogue. Okay? So, so I'm going to give, we're going to take one minute, and you guys are going to talk amongst yourselves, and then we're going to go fire right through these things. All right? Is that fair? All right, one minute, talk amongst yourselves.
We all good? You guys are finally having fun. That's good. All right. All right, here we go. Here we go. All right, so we're gonna, I have 12 commandments. Why are they 12 commandments, not 12 suggestions? Because they're not negotiable. Because in my life, my 163 years, right? In my life, this is what I believe the secret sauce looks like. You may not agree, that's okay. But this is the secret sauce according to me. And this is why they're commandments, they're not suggestions. This is why I say, this is why I say to groups, you know, if you like number two, but you don't like number seven, and you don't like number nine, and you, you know, you love number one, but no, no, no. This is not a shopping list. We're not shopping today, right? We're gonna go through these, so I look forward to hearing. Again, those are my words. I don't care about what I say. It doesn't matter to me. I hear myself talk all the time. Not really that interesting. What I'm interested in is what you believe. So my passion table, what do you think? So we, <laughs> so we think that um, having passion is being a leader that loves what you do and loves who you do it for. And you go to work every single day loving what you do and loving the people that you do it for. And that spills over, such as a CEO that helps train and develop their employees. It spills over, it's not just who they're working for or the clients, it's also the people that they're that they're working that are working for them and they develop them. So is passion, so passion something that. that you can fake? No. Do people try to fake it? All the time. All the time. Holy smokes. She didn't even hesitate on those answers, right? Thank you so much. That was great. Next we hand it to the next group. Thank you so much. I mean, why do we do that? Why do we try to fake all this stuff as leaders? You can't get away with it. You think you're you think you're really buffaloing people, but you're not. It's all I call it the old German Shepherd test, right? You can pretend you're not scared of that really, really nasty looking dog, but he knows whether you're scared or not. And if he senses it, boom, he bites you right in the backside, right? That's what I'm talking about. You have to believe it in your heart. You have to want to serve. You've got to want to do this. It's voluntary. Being a leader is voluntary. Next one, go ahead. Caring, who's up? Caring, all right. Uh, <clears throat> no one cares how much you know until they know how much you care. Bottom line is, if they don't think you care, they're not going to follow you. So you've got to have a genuine, uh, caring attitude or nobody's gonna wanna go along with the program. Awesome. I mean, can you, can you overcome a lack of caring with your intellectual horsepower? No. Why, why can't you do that? Why can't you? You can for a short period of time, but eventually it'll, uh, eventually, and it'll show pretty, through. Eventually comes pretty quickly, doesn't it, right? Yep. Yeah, absolutely, well done, thank you. So, that, I mean, that's the whole point, right? In today's world, people wear, you know, these like intellectual badges on their sleeve. Well, I'm this and I'm that and I've done this and I've got all these degrees. I don't give a damn. But more importantly, the people that you lead don't care. <laughs> you think that they do, but they don't. Super important point. Well done. Thank you. Next one. Go ahead. Archie. <clears throat> Our team had uh, earned, and basically we had kind of three different thoughts here. One being credibility and bringing it every day, effort and expecting effort from the organization and, and respect and giving that to your organization. Are you entitled ever? No. No. Holy smokes, none of us are entitled. What are we entitled to? Equal opportunity. I will fight to the death so that you get equal opportunity. We are not entitled to equal out outcome. We all need to earn it, and as leaders, you need to model that behavior. Model it. Awesome job, great job, thanks guys. Next one. Our table has persistence, and we would say that it sh means showing grit. It also means that even in the face of a lot of people looking at you and seeing you fail, that you persevere on, you show endurance. Per per persevere, persevere on, and life is a marathon, not a sprint. Please fail at something. 
Seriously. Because if, if you ain't failing at something, you ain't growing. Failure is never fatal, ever. Not trying is horrifically fatal. Awesome job, well done. Go ahead. Uh, our table had results and you know, being data driven, you have to make sure that you're going to achieve your results and if you're not, then you need to be nimble and flexible and keep moving so that you can eventually achieve it. Um, and if you can't ever achieve it, if you get to that point where you don't think you can, you need to change out what you're looking for. Right? Holy smoke, that's simple, right? But it's, it's exactly right. If you're not getting the results you need, should you continue to practice the same behaviors every day? Definition of insanity, right? Holy smokes, right? It's easy to think, to think about that when we're sitting here in this nice event, in this nice venue, but when we're in the action, when we're in the heat, when we're in the heat of battle, are you able to be nimble and flexible? I'm not talking about nimble and flexible in your principles or what you stand for. I'm talking about nimble and flexible in your tactics. What did I say earlier? Stand for something for goodness sakes, right? Whatever that is. But be flexible in your tactics. Because guess what? For you to stand up and say, you know what? Uh, team, and I've said this a bunch to my teams over the years, I was wrong about that, that approach. We are going to take a different tact, effective immediately right now. What have I done there? I've put the needs of the organization ahead of my own ego, right? Because I just stood up and said I was wrong. Tactics were wrong. That's what leaders do. That's what's crazy about the politicians. They never want to admit that they make a mistake, ever. If they stop trying to cover it up and just admit it, holy crap, life would be a lot better for them, right? Stop covering it up. There's nothing to cover up. Just say you made a mistake and it's time to move on. Let's go team, right? Next one, great job, thank you. Go ahead. So uh, ours was team. Um, one word that comes to mind for me and our team was unity and to find a common identity and goal that the entire team can strive towards and then using the team's strengths to get to that goal. And it's the leader's job to determine who has the best strengths in what areas to get them there. So is it the, is it the, lead, is it the leader's job to sort through all of that and then say, hey, you know, Johnny, you're good at this, Susie, you're good at that, and Tommy, you're good at that. Won't that, might, might that not offend somebody? Well, things could change, you gotta grow together. The needs of the organization outweigh that, right? Right, right. So, so, you know, we all have skills. We all bring skills to the table. We all are developing our skills in, uh, through our lifetimes. But remember, the best sports teams I've ever seen in my life, my 160 years, the best sports I've ever, teams I've ever seen have not been filled with superstars. They haven't been filled with, look at me, oh, I'm a big dude, I'm like this and that. They've been filled with guys and gals who decided to, that are experts in one area and they're gonna all come together and have the synergistic outcome. And not brag about who they are and their personal records and this and that and the other thing. Next one. Our team had judgment. And um, I think at first we struggled a little bit, but we decided that uh, with judgment, you're going to make mistakes in life. Uh, but if you are living by a, a higher set of morals and working for the people that you're leading, um, that's okay. Uh, just uh, you're doing the right thing even though perhaps you made a mistake. It's okay to make mistakes. It's okay to make mistakes if you're honestly making a mistake as opposed to serving each other. Make a mistake is fine, right? Using good judgment is fine. Um, it, what's really important is doing the right thing. May not be in the rule book in your company, but do the right thing. Great, great job, thank you. Go ahead, next one. Nice one, thank you. Okay, our team had accountability. Um, our discussion around accountability focused on accountability, I feel goes hand in hand with courage. We feel goes hand in hand with courage. Um, it takes courage to be accountable. Um, but when you are accountable, you're taking pride in what you're doing and you're owning your specific piece. You're not passing it off to somebody else. Um, you're owning it through the end. Um, the outcome may be successful or not successful, but it's how you carry yourself as a leader and what you do when you are successful or when you are not is what you want to demonstrate to your organization because that's the way you want them to lead and be accountable as well. Absolutely. A leader takes accountability. 
Store managers always come to me and say, well, I wasn't even on the shift when that, that server threw that plate of spaghetti on that person's lap. I'm not, I'm not responsible. Wait a minute, are you the general manager of this restaurant? Yeah. Well, then you're accountable. That's what accountability is. Well done. Thank you so much. That's great. Next one. Our word was humility. <clears throat> Um, I think we decided that success is rarely an individual accomplishment. Um, so by acknowledging those that were part of an outcome or a success, you, as a leader, you build a co cohesive, cohesive, cohesiveness within your team. It's a tough word yep. to say. Yep. Um, so thank you, Tony, Marty, John, and Allison for putting this thought together. Um, I think the other part of it that is important is uh, you're not always on top. So by being, demonstrating humility when things are down, um, you know, they're bound to come back around and you, you're, you've positioned yourself to be look uh, in a better light with your colleagues and team, so. Awesome, awesome, right. Self-importance is a horrible thing. We see it every day. My children, what I worry about is my children seeing it on TV all the time. The, the role models on TV need to be, inter, you know, interrupted and intercepted by you guys as parents and leaders. That's not the right role models. Let's just be clear, right? And I know it's tough to fight that. Next one. Great job, by the way, Brian. Nice job. Well done. So we had courage, and uh, with leadership, you're always trying to make decisions, figuring out how do we stay current, relevant, uh, how do we meet the needs of people. And really, courage is all about um, being able to change direction yes. as a leader and being able to say we're going in this direction even if it's not the popular way to go. So, um, yeah, it's one of the key things you need as a leader. Courage does not, is not in any way connected to any polling. Just to be clear. All right? Absolutely. Well done. Nice job. <laughs> Honesty. Who's up? We had honesty, and we decided that it was the ability to tell someone the difficult things, but be respectful of them, yes. and give them a path to change, and make them have the decision to make the change. That, you just beat him for that $10,000 prize. That was awesome. I can't even add anything to that. That's awesome, man. You guys can, buy, you guys can split up the prize, okay? That's, that's, that's awesome. Gratitude. Yeah, Robert, we, um, we talked about a lot of stuff, but it rolled back around to parenting, and we were saying that just like you're trying to catch your kids being right, uh, the same with staff, that looking out for the opportunity to catch them being right and then making sure you respond with praise. Yeah, gra gra I mean, there's a bunch of ways to demonstrate gratitude. Here's the thing I'll leave you with on gratitude is, can someone tell the difference between a sincere, hey, man, thank you so much for helping me, Versus, hey, thanks a lot. Yeah, it's great, great. Thanks, appreciate it. Don't BS people. Don't do it. They know it. If you don't feel gratitude in your heart, you can't deliver it. Awesome. You guys did a great job. You all deserve a, a great uh, round of applause for all the work you guys did there. So isn't this true? So I wanted to include some things about what some authentic leaders, I think, say, and they're not per perfectly word for word because this is what Abraham Lincoln said, but boy, oh boy, isn't that true? Work is weightlifting for the character. If you've never built any character, give the person power and you're gonna have a train wreck. And that's exactly what he's saying. Success isn't final. Failure's obviously not fatal. We talked about that, right? Gotta have the courage to continue. That counts. Those who don't weep for, uh, with their whole hearts don't know how to laugh either. This is the thing that I'm saying. She was a very courageous woman. He, he, here's the thing, right? You gotta believe it in your heart. Because you have a, a degree or two degrees, it doesn't matter. You gotta believe it in your heart for you to be able to make other people follow you and respect you. It is about the heart. Yes, the surest test of discipline uh, is its absence and we certainly are experiencing that. Okay, here's the deal. Drum roll, this is it. This is it, please read them. A 
I can't leave for you. It is what it is. You're going to answer these questions with some quiet moment at home. And you're going to look in the mirror and you're going to say to yourself, am I doing the right thing for the entity that I'm leading and the people who are looking up to me? And only you can answer these questions. It's not about what Tony believes. It's not about anything. It's about what you believe. It's about what's in your heart. Leadership is voluntary. You don't have to do it. It's super important to take these questions home with you. Quiet times when the kids aren't screaming and running around the house and, and, and your spouse is not yelling at you for something. Say, who am I really? What am I really all about? What do I stand for? Who am I? What's my authenticity, my personal authenticity? Super important. Make a decision. Don't be one of those people like I talked about that when I go in and take over a company and they find places to hide. Make a decision. Be the leader that you're now asked to be. Make a decision in your, in your, in, within, within your companies and you will get credit for it, even if it's the wrong one. I used to tell my managers, I give you an A plus for the right decision, an A minus for the wrong decision, and an F for no decision. Be leaders, be thoughtful, care about other people, make decisions, that are for the good of the enterprise that you're leading, not for your personal good. Be about serving others. And I'm telling you the rewards will be tenfold. They will be tenfold. The life of serving others is so much more fulfilling than a life of serving yourself. Guys, from my heart to, to you, thank you so much for listening to me for an hour and a half. I appreciate it. And I don't think, I don't think you're going to let me ask any, answer any questions, but um, uh, I'm, happy to, uh, I'm happy to do that if you want. It's up to you, Todd. You're the first speaker that we had that was down here on ground level. Um, one thing that I noticed is I don't see many cell phones out, which is really cool, very engaging. I want to thank you for being <laughs> My here. My pleasure. My pleasure um, to be here. Thank we you. have a gift for you, Brian's got, that uh, okay. we picked up. Okay. We, uh, we appreciate you being here. My pleasure. The one thing that you may not know about thank Tony you. is he actually lives in Delaware. And I know that you mentioned Delaware and your connection to Delaware, but yep. that's a really big deal. This whole thing is for Delaware by Delaware. We've got a lot of talent in this state. It's here, it's right here, and we appreciate it. Well, very thank much you so. so much for having me. Thanks for putting up with me. I appreciate it, guys. Thanks. Uh, my pleasure. Two o'clock. The economy panel will begin at two o'clock. You're welcome to stick around until then, meet folks you haven't met yet, and we'll see you back here at two o'clock.